All right, good morning, and we are live. Uh, good to have everyone with us present today, and uh, always good to know that there'll be folks joining through the Facebook Live and later on through the YouTube. And uh, we have a young man, uh, Chris Walker, who has kind of taken over for Dave Coker in uploading the messages to YouTube. And so, Chris, we appreciate you doing that. And uh, thank you for that ministry, and that helps us to reach other people with the message uh, that you, the Lord has given us. Today, we're going to uh, pick up with the idea of Scripture. And where last week we talked about the authenticity of Scripture, this week I want to talk about the precision of our King James Bible. You say, Brother Sam, you sure do harp a lot about the King James Bible. Well, I know that everything, if we're going to be really anchored and really confident in what we believe regarding spiritual matters, regarding God and his dealings with mankind and man's opportunity to respond, if we're going to be really assured and really confident, then in my mind it starts with the assurance that the book we hold in our hand is the very words of God. If we have doubts about the uh, precision of the book in our hand, if we have, if we listen to uh, those who uh, are educated beyond common sense, okay, uh, if we listen to those folks, then they will create doubt in the Word of God. They'll tell you that there's no such thing as a perfect Bible today. And when you really start nailing those people down, they don't believe that a perfect, complete Bible ever existed because they believe that only the original manuscripts, the actual books that Moses wrote or David wrote or Paul wrote or whoever, the Bible authors, they believe that only those books were the inspired words of God and that over the course of time that through the copying errors and then translation issues and so on, uh, they believe that uh, only the original manuscripts were the inspired words of God, perfect word of God. And so uh, over the course of time with, again, translation and, and copy and so on and so forth, uh, they say man got their hand in there and there's no way man could have kept that right. Well, God used men to write the books in the first place. And so if we're going to use the idea that men messed it up, well, we never had anything because God used men to give it to us in the first place. And then I like to point out when I say that they don't believe that a complete perfect Bible ever existed anywhere on the earth that a man could read is because by the time Jesus shows up on the scene and in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and so on, by the time he shows up on the scene, the scriptures to which he refers, the scriptures to which the, old, the New Testament writers refer, those scriptures would have been copies of copies of copies of Old Testament of the original manuscripts. And so the point being that, you know, 400 years from the time of Malachi until John the Baptist shows up on the scene, 400 years that that original little letter that Malachi wrote, which was the last book of the Old Testament, if that thing had been used and handled, don't you think it had torn up in 500 years? And they'd have had to have copies of copies of copies of copies. And so if, if Malachi's book was destroyed by the time Jesus shows up, original manuscript, then certainly the books that Moses wrote and so the point being, if only the original manuscripts are the inspired words of God, never at one time on the face of the earth has there been Genesis through Revelation compiled in the original manuscripts. That makes sense to everybody? And so God had to be involved in the, not only in the inspiration, but in the preservation process. And to me, the preservation of Scripture is, is foundational. I mean, it's... I mean, besides the gospel of Christ, that's probably the, I mean, that's the second most important that a believer can get settled in their mind because without that, if you don't know the book in your hand is the word of God, how can you know that what you're reading and what you're basing your doctrine on is true or correct? 
you got to know that every word in the book is exactly like God wanted it to be. And so we start with a couple of verses of Scripture. I'm going to start with, uh, and you kind of know already where I'm going to go to start this thing, Psalm 12, 6, and 7. We're just going to hit two passages in Psalms, and then we're going to carry on with the information I want you to have today as we build this and hopefully help you uh, get anchored in this. So Psalm 12, 6, and 7. This is the place where God promises to preserve his word. Other places make inference. Other places it's implied. But here he actually uses the words. And so that's why we use this. Psalm 12, 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And so he says the words, not the thoughts, not the major themes, not the major doctrines, but the words. Now, I'm just ignorant enough to believe words means individual words. How about you? The words of the Lord are pure words. And so we got every word, the words of the Lord, they're pure, pure words. And he says, as silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times so there's a purification process to bring it about and he it says it's purified seven times we know seven is the number of completion in our bible study the word seven through the scriptures and it's the number of completion things are finished in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth and as he gives the record of the creation of the earth in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 there, we find out that it's on the, he worked six days in the creation. On the seventh day, he rested. Why did he rest? Because he was finished. He was done. And so seven is a number of completion. And we could go on and on with that. That's an interesting study, Bible numerology. And so he says in verse 7, interesting, verse 7, <laughs> He says, thou shalt keep them, what? The words from verse 6. What else could it be talking about? I mean, just plain old English grammar. He says, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver, silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, those, those words of the Lord, those pure words that are purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation. How long? Forever. Forever. So we have a promise from God that the words, which are the pure words of God, he, he is going to keep them and he is going to preserve them from when the time they're given forever. Everybody good with that? Psalm 138. This is another interesting passage. We know that there's coming a day, Paul tells us, when every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? I mean, uh, the name of Jesus Christ is exalted. It's lifted up. We know that, 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 that He is the head of the body of Christ. He will be the king of this earthly kingdom for Israel and so on. And so we know how the name of Christ is exalted, but notice what it says in Psalm 138, verse 2. The psalmist writes, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Now, is that not a pretty powerful statement? I mean, we know that the name of Christ is exalted. We know that the name of the Lord God of Jehovah is exalted. We know that that, that is the theme of the book, the work of God and the work of Jesus Christ. And he and his name is exalted. But the psalmist writes, by inspiration of God, thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Well, if he's magnified his word above all his names and he's given those words and he's promised to keep those words and preserve those words, I'd say that the words of God are pretty important. Not only for us, but to God himself. And so we start with that on our mind and with that foundation and we'll carry on from there. 
several points we want to make. And uh, the first point I want to make as we do this, I want to talk about the past, uh, the past of scriptures. One of the things that people will throw up, and it's just it's been thrown up at me recently even, uh, but it's people that want to argue against the precision and the perfectness of the King James Bible, they, they want to throw up, well, what did mankind do before the King James Bible showed up? And they think that's a gotcha question. Well, think about this. And so that's why I like to look at the past of Scripture. From Adam to Moses, who had a written Bible? What's the answer? Nobody. From Adam to Moses, you know how long that was? 2,500 years. For the first 2,500 years of humankind, and if we've been around for about 6,000 years, so nearly a third, right? Pretty close to a third. I, don't, I didn't do the fractions. I probably should have done the fractions. But if 3,000 years would be a third of 6,000 years since creation, 2,500, that's, that's in the ballpark of a third. A third of mankind's history, from the time Adam showed up in the garden, mankind had no written words of God at all. And then from Moses to Malachi, the writing of the Old Testament, one, it was written in a language, it was written in the Hebrew language. So who, had, who could read the Bible that was given what we call the Old Testament from Moses to Malachi, who could read that? Only people who read and spoke Hebrew. Now, way back there in Genesis 6, God tells us about the flood and Genesis 9 and all the stuff that happened and then, you know, how the earth got spread out and God confounded the languages and so on and so forth at the Tower of Babel. So there was one group of people that spoke the Hebrew language, and that was the Jews. Who had the word of God from Moses to Malachi? The Jews. You had those three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so Shem and being uh, where the Jews came from, Abraham came out of Shem and Isaac and Jacob and so on. And so you have Abraham and his seed and right on down, and, and they had that Hebrew language. And so none of the folks of Ham and none of the folks, folks of Japheth and even a lot of the folks that came out of Shem didn't speak Hebrew. So for 1,500 years in the giving of Genesis to Malachi, the only ones that had the word of God in their language were those who spoke Hebrew. So when somebody says, well, well, who had the Word of God before God gave us the King James Bible in English? Well, nobody had it for the first 2,500 years of mankind's existence. And then for the next 1,500 years after that, only the Hebrews had it in a language. And so we carry on from there. And then the books of Matthew through Revelation. Of course, we know there was 400 silent years. And then you have the book of Matthew through Revelation, what we call the New Testament. And that took place, and we're just going to say the first century, the first hundred years. I think, I think the first book that was actually written was Matthew around A.D. 37. And then the last book written was 2 Timothy about A.D. 68, maybe 69, uh, right before the beheading of Paul. And, of course, just a year or two before the, uh, the, the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. So really we're talking about a period of... 37, 47, 50, 60, 57, 67, over a period of about 30 years, the New Testament books were written, okay? But let's just give it that 100 years of the first century. And that book was written, those, those books that were written that we call the New Testament, they were written in the language called Greek. And so now you've got uh, the Old Testament in Hebrew, and who can read that? The Jews. And then you got the New Testament in Greek. And who can read that? People who can read and speak Greek. Those who were under the Roman Empire during that period of time. And so then from for, for 4,100 years of mankind's existence, so now we're talking two-thirds of mankind's existence, 
Very few had access to the scriptures. So the idea, well, who had or where was the scriptures? Well, for a third of the time, no one had them. And then for that other period of time, very few had them. And so we carry on. And so after the first century, then began the preservation. Of course, God had been preserving the Old Testament, preserving those New Testament writings. But So that had continued. But then once that canon of Scripture was complete, once Paul had written 2 Timothy and it was all done, it was all fulfilled, it was all complete, then there's 1,500 years of preservation and copies and then the translation process began putting Hebrew and Greek into the languages of the world. Everybody there? And that took place over about a 1500 period of time up until we get that King James Bible. So from the 1st century to the 16th century, when we get the King James Bible, there's 1500 years of preservation and translation process. Then after the King James Bible was given, then, for the next, then, then over the course of the next 200, 300 years, this Bible that was given in the English language becomes the language of the world, the global language. You've heard me say it many, many times. If there's someone in this world and they speak two languages, the chances are they speak their native tongue and they also speak English. And that's just the way it is. And so... Uh, if you want to go to a university in communist China, you've got to speak English. If you want to be a commercial airline pilot, it doesn't matter where you're from in the world. If you want to be a commercial airline pilot, you have to speak English. Not Greek, not Hebrew, not Chinese, not Mandarin, not Russian. You've got to speak English. And so it's the global language. And so... Since the 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s, the King James Bible given in the 1600s, English becomes the language of the world over the next couple of hundred years. So from, again, the late 1800s, the early 1900s, more people have had, have had access to the written words of God in a language that they can read, study, preach, teach, and so on, than at any other time in human history. That's pretty significant. That's kind of a big deal if you ask me. And so when somebody says, well, what about those who didn't? I said, well, I'm going I'm to turn around and answer your question with a question. Don't you think it's significant that whatever Bible was available through human history, that since the late 1800s, early 1900s, the majority of the population of the world have had a Bible that they could read in their own language, and that's the King James Bible. Of course, it was given 300, 400 years earlier. Now, if English had become the language of the world by the late 1800s and early 1900s, giving access to the words of God to the most of the population, then... Uh, when do you suppose the first perversions began to show up? Right around that time. Who do you think might be behind that? Satan himself. Again, how many times have we said we're first introduced to Satan in Genesis chapter 3 and the first words out of his mouth is, Yea, hath God said. You read a few verses into there and, and Satan comes out and says, Thou shalt not surely die. Come outly, outright denies and contradicts the word of God, what God had told Adam. In 1885, the first English version, the first version that was presented to the world based on the polluted, corrupted manuscripts in the language of the world, in English. It's called the English Revised Version. It showed up in 1885. The church, the body of Christ, had been satisfied with the authorized version, the King James Version, since it was published in the 1600s. And then all of a sudden, some group of folks showed up and said, 
well, we think we need to revise that. And so they came up with the English Revised Version in 1885. And then one that you probably have heard of, the American Standard Version. Guess when it came out? 1901. And these versions were based upon the polluted manuscripts that come from the Catholic Church and that line of manuscripts the Catholic Church has used and they use those manuscripts to correct the King James Bible. That's why they felt like they needed a, another version. Again, who do you think would have been behind that? I believe Satan himself. And then in 1971, the New American Standard Bible came out. In 1973, the New International Version came out. 1982, the New King James Version came out. 2002, the English Standard Version came out. And then in these last 20-something years, there have been a multiplicity of different versions that have come out. I will say to you that the love of money is the root of all evil. King James Bible itself does not have a copyright. If you want to start publishing Bibles and you're so inclined, you can go buy the equipment, you can go buy the necessary machinery, you can get the necessary help, and you can get all the stuff you need to do it, and you in the basement of your house or out in the backside of your barn or wherever you want to do it, you can start publishing and producing and selling King James Bibles, and you don't need to ask anybody's permission to do it. It's the only Bible there is without a copyright. You can't do that with any other Bible version. You know why? It's copyrighted. You can't go out and start producing NIVs and selling them or giving them away. You can't go out and get New American Standards and start publishing and sending them out and giving. You can't even give, do it and give them away. Copyrights. You can only do that with King James Bible. Remember there in Psalm 12, 6, and 7 where it says the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times? When we have that translation process then translating from those original languages from the pure stream of manuscripts you've got the Tyndale which was a New Testament in English then you had Coverdale's Bible which was the first complete Bible then you had the Matthew's Bible then you had the Great Bible, and the Great Bible, I'm told as I've studied, was the first of those Bibles that was produced in such a way that they were intended for public use. In other words, anybody and everybody could get a hold of one. Then you had the Geneva Bible that followed the Great Bible, and the Geneva Bible was the first one that started numbering the verses. Boy, let not that help to us? Thank God for the great Bible that was made available for public use and the Geneva Bible that put everything in verses. So when we say go to Psalm chapter 12 verses 6 and 7 that makes that easy to do. So a great improvement. Again I tend to think God is involved in all that stuff. Then you have what was called the Bishop's Bible and then finally you have the King James Bible. Purified seven times. Six English versions, and the seventh one is the King James Bible. And I'd say at that point, God completed giving us the Word of God in the English language, and that language then became the language of the world. Does that not give us some confidence in our King James Bible just starting right there? Purified seven times. Now I want to quickly go over the process. You may have heard this before, but let me quickly cover the process. I always have that there, and I never take a drink of it. All right. So think, here's the process that we came up with the King James Bible. And the reason I'm going to go over this is because even today, even folks who preach out of a King James Bible or those who criticize a King James Bible, and when I say preach out of it, I don't mean they believe it. They just use it. There's a difference, Right? There's a difference in believing a book and just using the book. Somebody who's just using the book, they may find an occasion that they don't like a necessary word and they want to go to the Greek and they want to say, 
you know, our King James Bible says this, but I think a better word would have been this. You ever heard that done? I think a better rendering would have been this. I think you hear people say, uh, the King James says this, and I think that was an unfortunate translation. Well, again, you've heard me say this many times. I call that arrogant audacity. And I call it that because of the process that God put in place using King James to produce this King James Bible. You say, does God use men like that? Well, my Bible tells me he does. Here's the process. In 1604, King James announced that 54 Hebrew and Greek scholars had been appointed to translate a new Bible for English-speaking people. The number was reduced to 47 by the time the work formally began in 1607. Rather than working together all at one location, these men were divided into six separate groups which worked at three separate locations. There were two at Westminster, two at Oxford, and two at Cambridge. Of course, those are the educational capitals there in England. Two at Westminster, two at Oxford, two at Cambridge. Even today, you go to the bookstore, you buy a nicer Bible, it may be the Oxford King James, or the or the uh, Cambridge. Deb likes the Cambridge King James. All right, number three. Each group translated a selected portion of Scripture. So you had these six groups, and so one group was assigned this portion, and, you know, Genesis, the, the Pentateuch, so to speak. And the next was assigned major prophets, or the next was assigned minor prophets, and, you know, so on and so forth. They were assigned specific parts of the Bible to group. Verse 6, or verse 6, <laughs> verse number 4. All right, so each group is selected to translate a particular portion of Scripture. Each scholar, number 4, made his translation of a book and then passed it on to be reviewed by each member of his group. And so you had the six groups, and you had those 47 men divided into those six groups, and then with, within that group, they were given a certain number of books to translate. Each individual in that group took those books and translated them themselves on their own. Each individual man. And then, once that man did that, then he took the work he did and he made copies and he gave that to every other person in their group. You follow me with this? And so he translated, each individual translated, and so once they finished what they did, then they shared their work with one another, and then this guy who gave his copy or what he did to all those others, he's now got all the work of all the others. He goes over all their work, and they compare everything. That's quite a process. Then... Once they do that individually, then the whole group comes together and they come to an agreement about the whole product. You said it like this, you thought it was this, you said it like this, you thought it was this, here's the languages, here's the manuscripts, let's come together and make a decision about what the wording should be, what should be the words that we use here. Seems like a pretty pretty detailed, intensive process, doesn't it? Once a group had completed a book of the Bible, they sent it to be reviewed by the other five books, other, other five groups. So this group finishes Genesis. They've gone over it like we said. Now they send Genesis to the other five groups. Guess what the other five groups do? They go over that thing. So they send it to be reviewed by the other five groups. All objectionable or questionable translating was marked and noted, and then it was returned to the original group for consideration. So these, this first group of six or seven men, they did their work. They took the work they did. They sent it to those, the rest of those guys, the other 40 or so, those other groups. They go over it. They make notes. They, you know, they use that red Sharpie, that red pen, right? That yellow highlighter, 
And they go through there and think about this and think about that. They send it back to the original group. And so uh, uh, the original group then goes over their suggestions and recommendations and they make decisions and they either keep what they had or say, hey, those guys had a good point. Maybe we ought to fix this. That's the process. Once that was all done for all 66 books, then a special committee was formed by selecting one leader from each group. This committee worked out all the remaining differences and produced the finished copy. So once they had gone all over that process, then they took kind of the head person from each of the groups, six groups, they came together and they took the whole thing and they went over it and they came to an agreement and there was the book. Now you tell me, number one, and I didn't even talk about the, the skills, the linguistic skills and, and, and intellectual capabilities of the men that were on these, I mean these guys could not only read in the original languages, Hebrew and Greek, they could think in those languages. I mean, these guys, had, these, some of these guys had known these languages since they were three and four years old, five years old. These were geniuses. That's how our King James Bible was produced. Now you get some guy with a PhD who took a couple of years of Greek or Hebrew in seminary and he stands up in a pulpit and he says, an unfortunate translation is, do you understand what he just said? He just said, I know more than those 47 men knew and the process they used to produce and say that's the word that ought to be used. I know more than they know. Now, does that seem pretty outrageous to y'all? That seems extremely outrageous to me. And so there's the process. It says this means that the King James Bible went through at least 14 examinations before it ever went to press. It says throughout this process, any learned individuals of the land could be called upon for their judgment and the churches were kept informed of the progress. That's the process to produce our King James Bible. There has no other Bible been produced with such a process. None. How do you, how do you improve on that? Let's carry on. We're talking now about the precision. The title of the message is the precision. We've talked about the past. We've talked about the process. Let's talk about the precision. Pre precision. Some of this we're going to get in our Bible a little bit. Some of this you've heard me say before, and some of them just in passing, but today we're going to try to look at the scriptures and see if we can identify a few these things while we're here. You've often heard me say that the T pronouns and the Y pronouns are important. The King James translators knew that in those original languages, and bring them to the English language, they knew as they read that there were some times in the context of the original languages that this was talking, this word or this thing was about a specific individual or that this thing was about a group, of, a, a plural group, a group of individuals. You with me? And they had no real way in the English language to purvey that. And so therefore, they decided in this process that when they use the word thee, thou, and thine, that would be singular. And then they would they use the word ye, you, and yours, that would be plural. Now I might say, Derry, Dewey, <laughs> are you going to ride today? I'm talking to an individual. If I'm talking to this group, I'm going to say, are you going to ride today? That's the English language. You really don't know if I wrote the sentence down, are you going to ride today? 
I mean, it takes more information to know if it's, I'm talking to an individual or I'm talking to a group of individuals, the way we use language. And so the King James translators knew that, so we said, we can fix that. So when people complain about the these and thous and thines and the yees and so on, they complain about that. We need to modernize that. We need to take that out of our Bible. What have they just done? They just eliminated something the translators did to show the difference between singular and plural as God's giving us his words. Again, that can affect doctrine. John chapter 3. We've been there before, but let's do John chapter 3. Try to keep all myself in order. Go with me to John chapter 3 because that's an important place. Everybody knows John chapter 3. So as you turn there, John chapter 3, Sam. Let's read down through here a minute. Pay attention to the these and the ye's. So there was a man of the Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, who's he talking to? Nicodemus. Who's the thee? Nicodemus. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot, enter, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Nicodemus, where are we at? Verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Nicodemus, what's the next word? Ye must be born again. Now, if you take a modern Bible version and you take out the these and thous, it's going to say, Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. And if you come away with that, then everybody must be born again, right? But what's he say? One, he's talking to a ruler of the Jews. He's talking to a master of Israel. This is given to us by John the Apostle, who is an apostle of Israel. So what do we know that everything in this book is going to be about? It's going to be about Israel. And so here's Jesus, a minister of Jesus Christ for the circumcision to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, right? Here's Jesus talking to Nicodemus, this ruler of the Jews, this master of Israel, and he says to him in verse 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, Nicodemus, ye must be born again. Who's the ye? It's a plural word, right? Yes? yes. Ye is plural. So if Jesus tells the man Nicodemus, thee, ye must be born again, is he telling Nicodemus he must be born again? He's saying Israel must be born again. Ye, plural. He talked about being a master of Israel. You're a ruler of Israel. Does that make sense to everybody? Is that too far of a stretch? Marvel not that I say unto thee, Nicodemus, ye, the people of whom you are a ruler of, the people of whom you are a master of, ye must be born again. Do you think that the, there's a pretty doctrinal important issue going on by having the singular pronoun and the plural pronoun in John chapter 3 verse 7? Sure there is. Now we could go on and talk about being born again turned off. But that's one of those emergency calls. From McHugh in Tennessee. Y'all get those calls from McHugh in Tennessee? Uh, they're going to tell us the storm's coming. So there you go. Back down the hatches. All right. While you're there, go with me to Matthew 16. Let's talk about this one in just a minute. 
Matthew 16. Matthew 16. I'm not going to labor on this a long time, but I just wanted to give you a couple of places. Matthew 16. Again, we're familiar with John 3. We're familiar with Matthew 16. And it's in Matthew 16. Page is sticking. And we begin at verse uh, 13. Matthew 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Who's he talking to there? The twelve apostles, right? He's there, look, he, verse 13, he asked his disciples. And so there's a reference there, he's the disciples. And so you look at context, and it's, he's got the twelve apostles there. And so he asked his disciples. He says, okay, he asked them, who do men say that I am? And they answered this and that. And he says, well, who do ye, plural, the twelve, say that I am? Everybody see that? Okay. Again, context. It's not all of Israel. He's not talking to all of Israel here. He's talking to the 12 apostles. That group, plural, 12 men. All right? And so, verse 15 again. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now again, if we were saying that today, and we took the these and thous and thines out, we'd say... You are the Son of the Living God. But the specific the, the precision of our King James Bible says, Thou, singular, art the Christ, the Son of the Living God. Verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee. <coughs> Who was it spoke out? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. It was Simon. He says, Flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, Simon Peter, but my Father which is in heaven. Verse 18. And I say also unto thee. Who's he talking to? Simon Peter. He's not talking to the whole 12 apostles there, right? Marvel not that I say unto thee that thou art Peter, again singular, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We talked about what that is, the rock of the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. This church is not our church, but it's that church that was built uh, there in the first part of the book of Acts. And we don't have time to chase that today. Verse 19. He goes on to say he's going to build that church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Verse 19. And I will give unto thee. Does he say, I'll give unto ye, the twelve? He says, I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shalt be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he charged his, then charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. But who's given this power and authority over that church that he says he's going to build that he did build in the early Acts. Simon Peter. Who's the chief spokesman? Simon Peter. Who is it that gives, does the primary preaching in that early Acts? Simon Peter. Who is it that says to the lame man there in Acts chapter 3, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I to thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Who had the power to bind and loose? Simon Peter did. Who was it in Acts chapter 5 when Ananias... Get too many syllables in there. Ananias. <laughs> when Ananias and Sapphira came and they lied about what they had sold and they brought that there and Ananias came first and he lied about how much money he had gotten for his land that he was given. In other words, they were, they were to sell all and give all. But Ananias was only given a portion. He was going to hold back some of it for himself. And he came in there and who did he lie to? He lied to Peter. 
But as you keep reading, Peter says to him, why did you decide to lie to the Holy Ghost? And because of Peter's authority to bind and loose, what happened to that man? He died on the spot. A few minutes later, Sapphira comes in there, his wife comes in there, she tells the same story. Peter says, did you sell it for so much? And she said, oh yeah, I mean, that's the amount that, that Ananias had told her, that Ananias had said. So he said, did you sell it for the amount Ananias told me? And she said, oh yeah, that's what we sold it for. She lied too. Why, what did Peter do? He said, the same folks that carried your husband out are fixing to carry you out. Did not Peter have the part authority to bind and loose? And didn't Jesus tell him he would have that authority? He was the hook and bull. Well, why was he the hook and bull? Because Jesus made him that in Matthew 16 when he said, Thou, whatever thou bind, whatever thou loose. Now again, Catholics like to take that and say, You see, Peter, here he is, you know. But remember, that church is not our church. And so on and so forth. All right. We're done. That's right. We're done with that for now. All right. Now I want to talk to you about some other words. I may not have time to take you to the references, but let me just talk to you about the words just a minute. In our King James Bible, we have a word. Let me just give two words, and then we'll talk about the difference between the two words, the similarity and the difference. We have the word always. And we have the word alway. They come from the same Greek word. But the translators decided in some places to say always with an S. And they decided in some place to leave the S off and say alway. Same Greek word, but they translated it different. A little slight difference. And you go back and look and find the definition to that word... Well, why did they use, here's the Greek word, but here, and I think I've got 59 times they translated that word always, and 23 times they translated that word alway. Well, always means at, any, at every time and on every occasion. Whenever that comes up, whenever the trash can is full, I always will take it out. Right? Does that mean I'm perpetually taking out the trash? Well, you know. <laughs> but when do I take out the trash? When the trash can's full. At every occasion. Does that make sense? That's always, at every time, on every occasion. The word always means, or always, no S, means all the time, perpetually, throughout all time. And so there's a difference between always and all what? Precision. The Greek word or the Hebrew word that's used is the same. The translators decided to make a little difference. Why? Because they had an understanding we don't have today. And they chose to do that. And when you read it, it, again, I was having a conversation with a friend and he kept referring to somebody who knows and reads and studies the original manuscripts. And he kept talking about the original manuscripts. And I kept coming back saying, look, there's no such thing as the original manuscripts. They're gone. Been rotted away for hundreds of years. I said, now, if you want to talk about original languages, that's a different conversation. And he was like, well, that was a detail. I wasn't, I wasn't nitpicking over the difference of the words between original languages and original manuscripts. Now, wait a minute. Do you think it's pretty important to distinguish? Are we talking about original manuscripts or original languages? Is that pretty important? Yeah, that's pretty important. That's, you're not nitpicking. You're just paying attention to what's you ought to be paying attention to. And so when we read our Bible, people say, well, the, well, the word always or always, it doesn't make a difference. Well, if the definitions of them are different, how they're used are different, and if that word can affect the doctrine or the lesson, the instruction that's being given, 
Do you think that the King James translators were pretty precise by saying here we need to use the word always at every time on every occasion, but here we need to use the English word alway perpetually all the time throughout all time? That precision is pretty important, isn't it? Now again, I won't take the time to go to the references because I'm going to run out of time before I get done. We have a couple of other words. In sample and ex sample. An in sample is a sample from within. An ex sample is a sample from without. We, as we conduct our lives and study and discuss scripture and so on and so forth, we act as in samples from within this local assembly. Right? When you go out into the community, and you talk to people outside of this local assembly, here we are in samples to one another, samples from within. We go outside of our local assembly and we talk to people out in the community, now we become a, an X sample, a sample from without. Does that make sense? Again, same root word, same Greek word, there are those who would say, well, it just ought to be translated example every time. But if you, if you translate it example every time, you lose that sense of a sample from within or a sample from without. Again, I don't have time. You can do your own references. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 is a good place to go. You read through 1 Corinthians 10 and uh, get down through there and you'll see both of those words. That's why I say 1 Corinthians 10. You see the word in sample and the word example. In sample. In, an entrance. How do you remember in sample? Sample from within. You have the word entrance above a door. You're going in, right? You have a door. When you get inside, you turn around, and that same door has a sign that says exit, X, out. So an in sample, sample from within, X sample, sample from without. You can do your own study through there. All right, another word, truly and thoroughly. And by the way, in sample is used six times in our Bible. X sample is used nine times. Then you have the word throughly and thoroughly. Throughly means throughout, through and through. Thoroughly means completely. The word throughly is used 11 times in our Bible. The word thoroughly is used two times in our Bible. So did the King James Bible translators know the word thoroughly? Yeah. Yeah. Is the root word, the Greek word, or the Hebrew word the same? Yeah, for both words. Do we use the word today as we have conversation? We use the word thoroughly. We would, unless we're familiar with Bible language and adapt that as the way we talk, we may not ever in our life use the word throughly. You say, well, they're the same thing. And again, there are people out there that says you do no harm to the King James Bible if you said thoroughly every time. But again, the word throughly means throughout, through and through. Thoroughly means completely. I've given the example lots of times. I won't actually do it. I could actually kind of show right here. We would say this wall is thoroughly covered in green paint. Get outside the camera shot. <laughs> this wall is thoroughly covered in green paint. But I could take my pocket knife and I could stick it in there and would I find out that it's throughly covered with green paint? No. Is this thing permeated through and through? Is it completely covered? Yes. Is it through and through? No. Is there a difference between those two words? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That the man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. Not thoroughly, just on the outside. Throughly, inside and out. Does that make a difference? If you get a King James Bible and it says, and sometimes you do, you have to watch. That's one of those places I look. Yeah, you look at 2 Timothy 3.17, if it says thoroughly, somebody wasn't careful. Because the word's throughly. In Psalm 51, David said, purge me throughly from mine iniquity. 
think that might be important? Not just thoroughly, throughly. Go on from there. We have the words establish and establish. Establish is to set up for the first time. To establish is to build up or to hold up or to stab or to fix in place. Again, it's the same Hebrew word. It's the same Greek word. But the King James translators in some places chose to use the word establish 43 times. They use the word establish and 12 times they use the word establish without the E on the front of it. Again, that's important. Paul begins writing the book of Romans and he says, I'm writing this because I want you to be established. I want you to be set up for the first time. Well, he writes the book and he gets to the end in chapter 16 and he talks about these things to establish you, to fix you in place. In other words, if we get you established, now we want to build you up and hold you up. Is that two different things? So it's important to pay attention. Uh, again, I don't have time to give you the references. All right, those are the words I wanted to do. Now let me see where else I want to go. No amount of time. Give me just a couple more minutes. Mm -hmm. 2 Timothy 2.15. I'm going to compare versions just a little bit. 2 Timothy 2.15. You can look there if you'd like. 2 Timothy 2.15 in our King James Bible says, let me see if I got it right there. Yeah. And I can quote it, but 2 Timothy 2.15, our King James Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That New American Standard Bible says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word, handling the word of truth. Completely eliminates studying completely eliminates rightly dividing the word of truth. I wonder why churchianity at large has no clue about rightly dividing the word of truth. Because their Bible, their Bible doesn't tell them it needs to be done. New American Standard, let's see, let me find the NIV. Where's it? Uh, I'm sure I got it. Oh, right there it is. New International Version. I'm giving kind of the popular ones. New American Standard, New International. New International Version of 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best to present yourself. What is that? Crazy. Do your best to present yourself as one approved. A workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Again, they no study involved. Just do your best. You know? You send your kids out to muck the stalls. I don't know if I'll do it right. Well, what do we say? Do your best. Now, will you probably have to go behind them and do it right? Yeah. But we tell them, do your best. So, New International Version, they just want you to do your best. And correctly handle. Well, how do I do that? They don't tell you how to correctly handle it. But our King James Bible tells us to study it and rightly divide it. All right, so there's that one. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Again, these things are, you should be familiar. Romans 1, 16. And our King James Bible. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are, is there more than one gospel in our Bible? Have we learned that? Yeah. Do we know that the gospel of Christ is the gospel that Paul preached? Paul's gospel. Yes. Do we know we find the gospel of Christ in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, and Romans 3, 4 and 5, and so on and so forth? That's where we find the gospel of Christ, right? So he says, I'm not ashamed, Paul writing to the Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We know that that distinguishes Paul's gospel from other gospels that were out there. New American Standard. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But they leave out of Christ. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Leaves out the gospel of Christ. Well, if you don't say the gospel of Christ, what gospel are you talking about? Well, you know, most in churchdom don't understand that there's more than one gospel, right? Well, why don't they know that there's more than one gospel? Because their Bible doesn't distinguish that there's the gospel of Christ. Uh, New International Version. I gave you New American Standard. New International says the same thing. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Leaves out the gospel of Christ. Romans 3.22. This is one I always like to look at. Romans chapter 3, verse 22 says, uh, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. It says, The faith of Jesus Christ. We've talked about that. We've done a study on that. The faith of Christ. That's His faith, right? The faith that He exercised. When he left heaven's glory and submitted himself to becoming a human and was raised by, you know, earthly parents and then submitted himself to all the things he went through in his life, submitted himself to the sufferings of the cross, committed himself to take up on our sins, committed himself to go to the depths of hell and with the promise that God would bring him out victorious and make him the savior of the world, right? The faith of Christ. Pretty important, you think? New American Standard. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there's no distinction. Faith in Christ. What's that talking about? His faith or your faith? It takes out the faith of Christ. Why doesn't church to know about the faith of Christ? Because the Bible doesn't tell them anything about the faith of Christ. Takes it out. New International Version, again, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Galatians 2.16, Galatians uh, 2.20, Galatians 3.22, Philippians 3.9, or other verses that talk about the faith of Christ or the faith of Jesus Christ. Every one of those, and I didn't take time to print it out, but I did look, every one of those other verses so we got Romans 3, 22, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, those five passages in Paul's epistles, and Paul's the only one who talks about the faith of Christ. In five places in Paul's epistles, the faith of Christ, in the modern Bible versions, everything but your King James says faith in Christ. Do you think there's a precision in our King James Bible we ought to be paying attention to? Absolutely. Galatians 2 7. I only got a couple more and I promise I'm done. Galatians 2 7. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Do we have two gospels there? The gospel of the uncircumcision committed to Paul, the gospel of the circumcision committed to Peter. Gospel uncircumcision, who is that? The Gentiles. Circumcision, the Jews. New International Version. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been trusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. Does that take out the two gospels? That just says Paul preached to the Jew. Paul preached the gospel to the uncircumcised. Just as Peter preached the gospel to the uncircumcised, or to the circumcised. It takes out the gospel of the uncircumcision, the gospel of the circumcision. It says they preach the same gospel to just two different groups of people. Does that take away the idea that, hey, Peter's gospel was different than Paul's gospel? Yeah. But do we know by reading our Bible that Peter's gospel was different than Paul's gospel? Yeah, we do. Because we got a King James Bible. Does church, do churches know that there's a difference between Peter's gospel and Paul's gospel? No, because their Bibles take it out. The New American Standard says similarly to the New International. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. 
So Paul just says, I preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Same gospel preacher, Peter preached to the Jews. Instead of the same, Paul got a distinguished gospel, gospel of the uncircumcised, gospel, two different ones. Final passage here, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11, King James Bible. There's many places where it did this, but one, I've already out of time. Number two, I didn't take the time to look all of them up, but there's other places that you'll notice as you read and study. 2 Timothy 1.11. Paul writes here, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Guess what part of that's left off? Verse 11 of uh, 2 Timothy 1.11 of the New International says, And of the gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. Uh, New American, that was in New International, the New American Standard. For which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. They don't know that Paul's the apostle or the teacher of the Gentiles. Gentiles. Why don't they know it? Because they didn't. Because their Bible doesn't tell them that it's there. That's why when you talk to people about Paul's gospel, <laughs> when you talk to people about studying and rightly dividing the word of truth, when you talk about the gospel of Christ, when you talk about more than one gospel, gospel of the circumcision, gospel of the uncircumcision, when you talk about Paul being our apostle, church people look at you like you've got three heads. What are you talking about? I had something else here that I set it aside. Probably ought to point it out. Why is church so all confused about that? I don't want to do all of them, but this is a ranking as of 2022. The most purchased Bible in, as of 2022 was the New International Version. The second is the English Standard Version. The third is the New Living Translation. The fourth is the Christian Standard Bible. The fifth is King James Bible. Make top five. The most published, the most purchased book, the most purchased book at the end of 2022 of English Bibles, King James Bible is number five. All these others came before. I wonder why a church is confused. Do you think the importance of the King James Bible, the precision in our King James Bible is pretty important? I do. It's a well of pure water when I'm thirsty and dry and bread when I'm hungry and warm. When the battle is raging, it's my faithful sword, a shelter from life's troubled storm. It's a light to my pathway and a lamp to my feet when this world gets so dark I can't see. And I've not made a change in one word that it says, but it sure made a change in me. This blessed old book I hold in my hand. Not some fictitious thing that exists out there that nobody can see, feel, touch, read, study, believe, right? This blessed old book that I hold in my hand, it's true from beginning to end. It's the solid foundation where I firmly stand. Sin kept me from it. Now it keeps me from sin. When I think what it costs just to hold in my hand, I'm, it reminds me that I owe a great debt to all the martyrs who'd gone to the stake. Remember Tyndale, the one that translated the English New Testament? He went to the stake. And he said, Oh, I mean, while he's burning at the stake for translating the Bible into English, and by the way, he's been burned at the stake by the Catholic Church for translating the Bible into English, while Tyndale's burning on the stake, he's praying, 
Oh, may God open the king of England's eyes. A few years later, King James does what? I'd say God answered that burning martyr's prayer, right? Coverdale, the next Bible that came along, the full English Bible. Coverdale said, and he lost his life as well. Coverdale said, I would that the word of God was so available that the plowboy would know more of the scripture than the priest. I didn't get that quote exactly right. That's what you see, that's what that thing's all about. So when I think what it costs just to hold in my hand, I'm remi it reminds me that I owe a great debt to all the martyrs who've gone to the stake and quote it with their dying breath. Now its critics are many, believers are few, but one thing I've found to be true. If you find when you read it that there's something wrong, <laughs> then there's something wrong with you. This blessed old book I hold in my hand. It's true from beginning to end. It's the solid foundation where I firmly stand. Sin kept me from it. Now it keeps me from sin. The precision of our King James Bible. Say, Brother Sam, why do you harp on it? Because I believe I have a responsibility to try to instill in you a confidence in this book. Because it's in this book that you can know God. It's in this book that you can understand the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the grace of God. It's in this book. I'm just talking about the Bible in general, am I? I'm talking about this book. You can understand God's plan and purpose and what he's doing in a way that folks that don't have this book can never do. I want you to have the same confidence in this book that I have. But you know, I know where the Word of God is. It's in my hand. And then when you hear something else, you immediately tune it out because you say, <laughs> that ain't the book. This is the book. Father, again, we're grateful for a good day. Thank you for those who've listened. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convince and convict folks about the truth and the importance and the precision of this book in our hands. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling on till then. Who cares about the clouds while we're together? Just sing a song and bring the sunny weather. Happy trails to you till we meet again. Thank y'all. I do apologize for being so long. I know I really got long today, and uh, I, I apologize. But uh, the information needed to be there. Oh, yeah, thank you, Dewey. Uh, next weekend, no gathering here, 2nd of June. We'll most, a bunch of us will be in Indiana. I'll be in Indiana. So, Leo, if you want to come teach next Sunday, I'll let you have the keys. But otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, no one will be here next Sunday. And then, of course, uh, the 23rd of June will be at Timber Ridge uh, over there. All right, very good. Thank you.